Hebrews chapter 12, and tonight we're going to begin in verse 14. You need an ink pen or you need a pencil. And Hebrews 12, verse 14, the Bible says, Follow peace with all men, and a holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. But tonight, if you have a pen or a pencil, I want you to underline several words in verse 14. First of all, either underline or circle the word follow, follow. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Either underline or circle the word holiness. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Then either underline or circle this word see. So in verse 14, we have un either underlined or circled the word follow, the word holiness, and the word see. But tonight we're going to begin the very first of verse 14 with the word follow, where the writer of Hebrews says, follow peace. Let's all say that together. Follow peace. The word follow that is used in this verse is the Greek word dioko. The word dioko was an old hunting term which portrayed a hunter who put on all of his hunting gear and all of his fatigues and now he's gone out into the woods and he has deliberately decided he is going to hunt until finally he gets his game. And this is very important. Because it tells us this word follow, which also is a participle, which means you would translate it follow, 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 follow does not describe something that you do accidentally, but if you're going to capture peace in your relationships, it's because you've made a decision, you're gonna put on your hunting fatigues, and you're not gonna stop until finally you've captured peace in every relationship. And in fact, the word follow, the Greek word dioko, is such an aggressive word that in most places in the New Testament, it is translated as the word persecute, persecute. So to understand the word follow, you have to stop for a moment and think about what is persecution? What is persecution? Well, because the word persecute and the word follow both come from the Greek word dioko, it tells us persecution is not something that happens haphazardly. It's not something that happens accidentally. But when you are persecuted, the Greek word dioko, it means somebody has deliberately, strategically developed a plan to follow you, to capture you, and to take you down. And they're not going to stop until finally they have accomplished their goal. It is aggressive and it is deliberate. Now carry all of that into this word follow. Follow peace with all men. It means we can't stop and wait for peace to come to us. But if we want to have peace with our spouse... If we want to have peace with our boss, if we want to have peace with that friend that is so hard to get along with, we can't wait for them to initiate. We've got to put on our hunting gear and make the decision, I'm going to aggressively, strategically follow, follow, follow like a hunter. I'm going to follow the tracks, follow the scent, and not stop until finally I capture peace in this relationship. And I'm going to give you an example from my life. The last time that I preached in this church, I was remembering today, was December 1991. That was the last time I was here. And the reason I know that for sure is because I brought my family to Hawaii the month before we moved to the former Soviet Union. It was our big celebration just before we moved to the Soviet Union. One month later, we got on the plane, we flew to the Republic of Latvia, thinking that we were going to be there for one year. And now, nearly 18 years later, we're still there with a ministry so big, it's amazing to me what God has done. But when we first arrived, it was a very different world. We got off the airplane, Soviet soldiers met us, and they were standing there with all of their machine guns and we got in our car to ride to our city where we were going to live, and the road was totally dilapidated. It was in the middle of the winter, and when the car tried to pull up to the front door of our house, there was so much mud on the road right in front of our house 
that the driver had to make a run with the car, then hit the brakes so that the car could slide down the mud and then stop right in front of our house. And this was our new sophisticated home. And I had just moved my family into the midst of this dilapidated, dilapidated nation. But hearts were hungry for God. And I was invited to speak at a healing service in a great big hockey stadium. Well, when we showed up for the meeting, it was such a hockey stadium that there was still ice on the ground, and we had to wait for the hockey game to end before we could hold the healing service. So we sat in the sides of the stands, and we watched as the team played hockey. And finally, the hockey game was finished, and the team cleared out, and they opened the doors, and all the people began to come in for the meetings. Well, just imagine that this big auditorium is the floor of the hockey stadium. On one side is a little strip of carpet which runs right out into the very middle of the ice. At the end of that little strip of carpet, there's a pulpit just like this. On the other side of the ice, up in the bleachers, are all the people that have come to the healing service. After I preached and gave an invitation for people to receive healing, I watched as all of the old crippled people on canes and crutches came down the bleachers and began walking across the ice to get to the other side of the meeting to receive a miracle. And I remember thinking, this better be a miracle service because we're going to have broken bones all over this place. I had never seen anything like that. A healing service on ice. It was so cold in that building that my feet were freezing as I stood on that little bitty thin piece of carpet. Well, I didn't know it, but that night the local TV station was filming the service. And the next morning when I woke up, my wife and I sat there together watching me preach and hold a healing service on Soviet television, Soviet television. And as we sat there watching together, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, now I'm going to tell you why I really brought you to this part of the world. Well, I have found out many times that sometimes God will tell you something just to get you moving in the right direction. And he doesn't tell you the whole story until it's too late for you to turn around. And this was one of those moments. I'm going to tell you now why I really brought you to this part of the world. I want you to begin a TV network to take the teaching of the Bible into all the homes of the Soviet Union. Well, this thought was so strange to me. Because at that particular time, the communists were still calling all the shots. Freedom wasn't even really developed yet, and there was such a fear because Gorbachev had just been kicked out of office and people didn't know what was going to happen and instability everywhere. And the idea of starting a TV ministry in a communist nation. And I turned to my wife and I said, Denise, has God said anything to you? She said, Rick, you won't believe what the Lord just said to me. And we begin to confer, and the God had simultaneously spoken to both of us that we were to start a television ministry. Well, you know, I didn't know anything about TV ministry. Didn't have any money. But hey, who has money when God tells them to do something? <laughs> God never looks in your bank account to see how much money you have when he asks you to do something. He just asks you to obey. So you do what you can do. You don't have a lot of money, then you start with what you have. All we had was a home video camera. So we set up the home video camera, and I began to teach into that camera. Well, back in those days, all Soviet television was ugly, 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 so our program just fit in nicely with all the other programs. No one even thought it was unprofessional. And letters begin coming. And letters begin coming. It was the first daily Christian TV program in the history of the Soviet Union. No one had ever done this. 
No one. So many letters were coming that we decided we would advertise a great big event and then we would really know how many people were watching the program by how many people turned up for the meetings. So we decided to advertise for two weeks. Two weeks. That's not a whole lot of advertisements. But for two weeks, we advertised every day there's going to be a healing service. If you're sick, come. If you'd like to have a Bible, come, because there were not a lot of Bibles back in those days. And finally, the day came for the venue, for the meeting. And the venue seated 8,000 people. And as Denise and I drove down the road to the very first meeting, I noticed that there were thousands of people all walking down the street in the same direction. And I said to Denise, where in the world do you think all these people are going? I had no idea they were all going to our meeting. And when we got there, the very first meeting was packed to the brim. And in five days, 32,000 people attended the meetings. 7,000 people were saved. People were healed. Demons were cast out. It was just like when Philip preached in the city of Samaria. That was our first public meeting in the former Soviet Union. I think to start with 32,000 people is a pretty good start. And what was really exciting was at the end of that week, we baptized 926 people in one day. And the last night when I was standing on the stage, looking out at that crowd, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, now what are you going to do with these people? What do you mean, what am I, what am I, I going to do with these people? And I suddenly understood God was giving me a pastoral responsibility. He was telling me to start a church. Well, when you've baptized 926 people, you've got a pretty good core group to start your church with. So we rented a big auditorium downtown, announced that we were going to start a church, and bam! The Good News Church was born in the power of the Holy Ghost. Now we had a church. Now we had a TV ministry. Well, until that time, there was only one other charismatic church in this city of Riga where we lived. And the pastor of that church was a former Pentecostal, a very little guy, very short. Everybody knew him because he was so radical. And he wasn't just radical, he was very rude. He was crude. He talked terrible about other preachers. In fact, he had prophesied that he was the most anointed man in the whole nation of Latvia, and eventually all the other churches in Riga would close their doors, and all of the pastors would come on their knees in front of him to recognize he was the one that was really anointed. He was just offensive in every way. And I didn't like him. I didn't like anything about him. I didn't like the way he looked at people. I didn't like the way he talked to people. I didn't even like the way that he prayed. And I really didn't like his doctrine because he believed that every Christian had an infestation of demons. And they believed that at the end of every single church service, they were to have a deliverance extravaganza where demons were to be cast out every single service. Well, I believe that's a damaging doctrine if you think you've got demons and you can never get set free of demons. Praise God, the Bible says our salvation is a great salvation. And when we came to Christ, we got delivered, friends. We got delivered. And I believed it was a damaging doctrine. In fact, it was almost like a new kind of legalism where they were constantly trying to free themselves almost as if the blood of Jesus had never been enough by itself. So they would bind, they would loose, they would scream, they would screech. And you always knew when you met somebody from their church, because they all talked like this, because they screamed so much when they prayed, they stripped their vocal cords. You didn't even have to ask them what church they went to. You immediately knew they were from that church. But he had been there a while. He had about 800 people in his church. 
And occasionally famous people would come to Riga to preach in my church. And they would say, hey, we hear there's another church in town. And that pastor over there has invited us to come speak in his church. Should we go? No. No. It's a bad church. It's a bad pastor. You don't want anything to do with that church. And I found myself taking every opportunity to say something bad about that pastor. But one of my guests insisted on going to his church and insisted that I take him. <laughs> so I went, and when I walked in, the whole auditorium fell silent because the enemy was in the house. <laughs> but they very kindly seated me right on the front row and that was nice except everybody's staring at me the whole service. I'm on television. They all know that I don't believe that everybody has demons. They all know the pastor and I have a little problem between each other. But the service was pretty nice until we came to the end of the service. And then it was time for the deliverance extravaganza. And all of a sudden, the little woman sitting next to me, a very sweet, very kind, cultured little lady who had behaved so perfectly the whole service. The moment the pastor said, it's time to cast out demons, she threw her body back in the chair. Her head went back. Her eyes rolled back in her head. She began screaming, and her whole body went stiff as a board. Blood vessels bulging from her neck. She didn't have demons. That's just what she'd been taught to do in her church. But when I turned around, Every eye in the place was staring at me. <laughs> and I knew they were all wondering, does Renner have the power to cast out that devil? So I literally put my leg over her body, leaned over and said, stop acting like this and set up straight. She looked at me shocked and she fixed her hair and she straightened her dress and the whole place shouted because I cast the devil out. She didn't have a devil. She doesn't need to know how to behave in church. Just a bunch of spiritual silliness. That's why people need to read my book called Dress to Kill. Well, this little short pastor didn't like the fact that our church was growing. So one day he came into the pulpit of his church and he made an announcement. He said, I understand that there's another church in town. Seems to be growing very quickly. Don't want to say who it is, but it's an American <laughs> who's bald. But I'm just going to tell you what I believe. I believe that any preacher that is bald is under the curse of God. And anybody that goes to sit under that bald man is cursed. Well, of course, I heard about it. And when I first heard about it, I thought it was hysterical. But the longer I thought about it, it just hacked me off. And I wish that I could tell you I responded in the spirit. But the following Sunday, I came to my pulpit and I said, I understand there's another pastor in town I don't want to say who he is, but he's a little short guy. 
who says anyone that's bald is under the curse of God. But it's my personal opinion that if anyone's growth is stunted, they're probably the one that's under the curse of God. Now, would you please open your Bibles? And warfare, warfare began between me and that pastor. And you know, when you've got a problem with somebody else, the devil's sure to make sure you hear lots of things about those people. People would come to me with little tales, and of course, the worse it was, the quicker it was for me to believe it, because I wanted to believe every evil thing that I heard about him. And after many months passed, one day I was praying, and the Lord said, Rick, do you want revival? I said, Lord, you know I want revival. A second time, Rick, do you really want revival? Lord, you know I want revival. A third time, do you really want revival? I said, Lord, you know I want revival. And I heard him say, then get in the car, drive across town, get on your knees in front of that preacher and ask him to forgive you for your attitude. Do you want revival? And I said, I'm not sure. <laughs> Has God ever asked you to do a hard thing? Well, I did not quickly obey. Months went by. I became miserable, lost my joy, lost my peace. And every day it was like God was a hound dog pursuing me. I could hear the Holy Spirit saying, are you going to obey me? 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 I try to shake it off. I try to rebuke it. I try to rationalize that God would not ask me to do that. Why would God ask me to do that? Why would God ask me to do that? Why that arrogant little midget already is expecting all the preachers to come in front of him on their knees. He'll just see it as a prophetic fulfillment. This can't be God telling me to do this. But you know when it's the voice of God, it just doesn't go away. <sighs> so finally I said to my associate, get in the car. <laughs> Ride with me across town. I could have gone by myself, but I needed emotional support. When we finally got there, I sat in the car and <sighs> didn't even pray. It was beyond prayer. It's one of those moments when you're just dead, just dead. <laughs> so finally with my associate at my side, Andre, it was Andre. Walked in the front door of the building, and his guards, with all their walkie talkies, <laughs> like mafia all over the place. <laughs> Immediately, <laughs> the enemy's in the camp, the enemy's in the camp. <laughs> they literally just backed out of the way when I walked in the foyer. And I walked up the first flight of stairs to be greeted by another guard and another flight of stairs to be met by another guard and finally the third flight of stairs where I was met by another guard who took me to a door that was completely sealed with all kinds of locks and computer codes. Somebody opened it and I said, I'm here to see the pastor. 
The secretary said, he's in his office waiting for you. So I, you know, sometimes when God tells you to do something, you don't feel like doing what he tells you to do. Sometimes you just gulp and do it. And this was one of those moments. It's like right now. The Lord has instructed me to build a building. Downtown Moscow. It's like building a building downtown New York City. I mean, the starting price is $30 million. That's just getting started. Well, I have to tell you, emotionally, that's not real exciting to me. You just kind of gulp and say, all right, we'll do that. To the best of your ability, you try to kill all of your emotions. Because if you let your feelings dominate you, you will never do what God tells you to do. Well, on this day, I was just telling my flesh, down, down, down. Emotions die. Walked down the hallway and walked into his office. Can somebody bring me a chair? Can I have one of these chairs? And when I walked into the office, he, he was sitting in his seat on the other side of his little desk. Pretty cheap looking little desk, by the way. <laughs> I'm telling you, my attitude was terrible. I kept thinking to myself, no class, no taste. But I was in the room. Sometimes you just got to get in the room. I smile. We talked about the weather. We talked about our children. We talked about politics. Then there was nothing else to talk about. I said, well, you probably wonder why I'm here. I looked over at my associate and I said, pray for me. <laughs> he said, he literally said, don't do the knee thing. I said, you know, you're supposed to be supporting me, not helping the devil, keeping me from obeying the Lord. Just, if you're not going to pray for me and encourage me, then just sit there and shut up. I got on one knee and I heard the Lord say, both knees. Well, you know, I've already learned a long time ago, if you don't do it right the first time, he's going to make you do it a second time. This was too painful to do twice. <laughs> literally hovering over the edge of his desk looking at me and the look in his eyes such glee he was like his mouth was open this was the beginning of the prophecy being fulfilled and the first preacher to come on his knees is the bald American and I remember looking at him, thinking to myself, just shut those beady little eyes. Midget. If anybody ought to be on their knees, it's you that ought to be on your knees. If you were really a man, you'd be down here with me. And while he's 
hovering and staring. I said, I am here today to ask for your forgiveness. And by this time, honestly, I just shut my eyes. I can't look at it. My attitude toward you has been really bad. I've sinned against you. I've heard things about you. And I don't like you. I don't like your doctrine. I don't like the way that you treat people. I don't like the way that you run this church. I don't like the way that you've talked to other pastors. And I found myself slipping in the wrong direction. <laughs> that often happens when husbands and wives sit down to work things out. Have you ever noticed that? They sit down to have a nice talk and they end up accusing each other. And I had to literally pull myself back. And I said, but I'm not here to deal with you. I'm here to deal with me. And you see, before I came, I kept saying to the Lord, what about him? What about him? You think I've done wrong? What about him? What about him? And the Lord kept saying, I'm not talking to you about him. I'm talking to you about you. So I said, but I'm not here to deal with you. I'm here to deal with me. It doesn't matter what you've done. I've been wrong to harbor these things in my heart. And I'm asking you to forgive me. And on that day, on my knees, with the help of the Holy Ghost and determination, there was no emotion involved. It was simply a decision. It was determination. I'm going to put on my hunting gear. I'm going to put on my hunting fatigue. I don't care what I have to do, how far I have to go. I am not going to stop until finally I obtain peace with this man. And that day I captured peace. But let me tell you where people make the mistake. They go through all the emotion of confrontation. Finally, they have peace and they think that then it's over. But we're told in Ephesians chapter 4 that we have to endeavor to keep the unity of the peace. Once you get it, then you got to keep it. And sometimes keeping it is just as hard as getting it. To show how penitent I was and good favor, I wrote him a check for $20,000 for his building program. It's while I was in my building program. I said, I'm sowing a seed for our relationship. When I walked out of that meeting, I felt free as a bird. I had done the hard thing, but I had done the right thing. And then I heard that he stood in front of his staff and waved the check and said, look, Rick Renner is trying to buy my relationship. And immediately I had to make a decision not to lose the victory that I had obtained. I'm going to do whatever I can to keep the peace. And I'll tell you the truth. That's 15 years ago. I'm still working on that one. Because according to the flesh, he's still obnoxious. But he is my brother in the Lord, and I have made a decision. I'm going to appreciate who he is. Now, let me tell you something. The devil doesn't do anything new. He just keeps redoing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And what he tempts you with once, guess what? He'll tempt you with it again. Let me give you an example. Do you remember when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted? Do you remember the devil led him to the pinnacle of the temple? Do you remember that? And the devil said, if you'll worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. How many of you remember that story? And, of course, Jesus said no. Well, James, who wrote the book of James, was Jesus' brother. You know what happened to James? The leaders of the Sanhedrin came to James, 
and led him to the pinnacle of the temple, Jesus' own brother. It was a total repeat of the same temptation and said, we'll give you all the power of this city if you'll just publicly declare that Jesus was a fraud. In the same place, exactly the same kind of temptation. The devil just does the same thing over and over and over. So if you learn how he operates, then you can understand his devices. Well, when Denise and I moved to the city of Moscow after many years, we were excited. We'd started the church in Riga and turned it over to our associate. Now we're going to move to Moscow and do it again. But by this time, we're already known all over the Soviet Union because we've been on TV for so long and we're almost like legends. Well, we went to a meeting in Moscow at a friend's church, the biggest charismatic church in Moscow. And the reason we went was because a friend of ours was preaching there. Afterwards, we went to dinner. And when we went to dinner, the pastor said, Brother Rick, tell us what's new. I said, oh, thank you for asking. I know you're going to be so glad to hear it. We're going to start a church in Moscow. The room fell totally silent. Somebody dropped their fork on their porcelain dish. It was like I hadn't even said anything. No response, no praise the Lord, no when are you going to do that? Just, can we pretend that Rick Renner never said he was going to start a church in this city? In fact, let's act like the Renners aren't even in the room. Well, Moscow had at that time 10 million people. I think there was room for a couple churches in the city of Moscow. And you know what I realized? The devil was trying to repeat in a new environment exactly what had happened in the old environment between me and the other leading pastor in town. Denise and I went to their big annual event just to show our support. Well, you know, if Kenneth Copeland came to your church, I'm sure that Arden Kuna would give him a very nice seat in the house, not because he needs it or wants it, because it just shows honor. Well, when Denise and I came into the meeting, we came back in the back, and people were excited to see us. They all knew us from television, and the usher said, Our pastor has specially chosen your seat. Follow me. So we followed and followed. We kept following, kept following, kept following. Wondered where in the world is this seat? My goodness gracious, and we kept following, and Kept following and kept following, kept following. And finally, they seated me and Denise on the very last two seats on the front row of this giant auditorium as far from the center as possible. And I understood. I'm, I'm not stupid. I understood what was happening. Pastor was making a statement. He was not supportive, didn't like us starting the church, and wanted to do his best to push us out. And as I sat there with my wife, I said, well, we've been down this road before, and I'm not getting on my knees this time. I'm going to start out right. That night, I wrote him a check for $10,000 for his building program. You know, I just decided to write checks to everybody that has a problem with me. Just write him a check. <laughs> just write him a check. And immediately, Dioko, follow, chase, deliberately pursue, put on your hunting gear until finally you follow, 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 after peace with how many men? All men. Now, Romans chapter 12 says... To the best of our ability, we're to get along with all people. It means some people you can't get along with. But as far as it depends on you, from your side, you're to do everything you can to gain peace with all men. And the Holy Ghost knows the key to every man's heart. And if you'll listen to the Holy Ghost, He'll show you how to capture that peace. But notice what else the verse says. Here we have a command from Scripture. Follow peace with all men. And what was that next word I asked you to circle? 
holiness. Everybody say holiness. The word holiness is the Greek word hagias. The word hagias describes something that is separate, something that is different, something that is in a category all by itself. For instance, in the Old Testament, there was the holy mountain of God. If you looked at it, it looked like all the other mountains. According to the eye, there was nothing different. But when the presence of God touched the mountain, the presence of God sanctified that mountain. It separated the mountain. Once God touched it, it was no longer like the other mountains. It was Haggai's. It was holy. The word Bible. What's the full name? What is it? Holy Bible. Everybody say Holy Bible. Why don't we just call it Bible? Because the word Bible is the Greek word biblios. It simply means a book. But if you attach the word hagias, the word holy, to the front of it, aha, uh -huh, now it changes. Now it's not just a book, but it is a special book. It's a book that is in a category all by itself. There is no other book in this category. It is completely distinct, completely separate. There is no other book like this book. The Bible says we are called to be holy and we are called to be saints. Saints. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're looking at a saint. I'm Saint Rick. This is Saint Art. Saint Chris. We're saints. Now see, people get all freaked out because then they have all these religious images in their mind. Oh yeah, I better, I better cross. I better cross, saint. Saint, 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 saint. No, you got it all wrong. The word saint and the word holy are the same word. The Greek word hagias. If you look at us, we look like everybody else. But when the blood of Jesus touched us and the Spirit of God indwelt us, it was a sanctifying force that separated us from the rest of humanity. And we may be humankind, but we're not like everybody else. And the fact that we are saints, hagias, means God has separated us and our lives are never to be used for common, ordinary things ever again because now we're a totally different category of people. We're called to be saints separated, holy, sanctified, different. Everybody say different. Now carry that word different into the context of this verse. The word dioko, follow. Deliberately, aggressively, deliberately, aggressively, deliberately follow after peace. And can I just throw in one more thing? In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 1, the Bible tells us to follow after love. That word follow is the same word, the word dioko, which means if you want love in your life, then you need to quit waiting on people to ring your phone and knock on your door. If you want loving relationships, then you've got to do something about it. You've got to be like a hunter. If you want love, you've got to get up and go get it. It is exactly the same word. If you want love, you've got to pursue it. If you want peace, you've got to deliberately, aggressively pursue it till you capture it and be holy or be different different which means we don't have the right to act like the world we don't have the right to retaliate like the world we are not like the world God has for us a higher standard he requires us to be different without which no man shall what see the Lord now, when people see this word see, see the Lord, they think that it means, uh-huh. So, if I've got strife in my heart, or if my relationships aren't right, I won't go to heaven. The Bible says I won't see the Lord. Well, let me tell you something. Lots of Christians die with bitter hearts, and they wake up happy in heaven. This is not talking about your eternal status. This word see means to be admitted into the immediate presence of God right now. 
You could translate it, follow after peace with all men and be different. And if you don't, you will be prohibited from entering into the presence of the Lord. Which tells me unforgiveness, strife, unresolved issues in the heart build a wall that keeps me from entering into the presence of God. That's why many people come to church and they go through all the motions, but they can't feel the presence of God. They have no joy in their life. They're in the right place. They're listening to the right word, but there's some kind of a blockage between them and heaven. Something is stopping them from entering into the immediate presence of the Lord. And it's not always the devil. Very often it's unresolved issues. which restrict us from fully entering in. And that's why the next verse says, looking diligently, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby defile many. But notice that verse begins by saying, looking diligently. Everybody say that, looking diligently. It is the Greek word episkopos. The word epi means over. The word skopos means to look. It's where you get the word for a microscope or a telescope. Scope, skopos. When you compound the two words together, looking diligently becomes the Greek word episkopos. It's where you get the word for the Episcopalian church. The word episkopos is the Greek, or is the Greek word for a bishop. A bishop. So you have to think for a moment, what does a bishop do? A bishop does what? He oversees a group of churches. I've got 800 churches in my association. In a certain sense, I'm the bishop. I have oversight. I have management. And if something wrong happens in those churches, guess what? I'm going to answer to God for those churches because I'm the one that has oversight. I have authority over those churches churches. Well, if you translate that in the context of this verse, it literally means to bishop, to bishop. And it's a command to each one of us that we are to take on the role of a bishop, which means I'm a bishop, you're a bishop, there's something that you have oversight of, and in this particular sense, we're all bishops. You say, I'm a bishop of what? You're a bishop of your own heart. It's your heart. You might blame your wife for how you feel. You might blame your parents. But the truth is, it is your heart. Nobody else is responsible for your heart. It is yours alone. You decide what gets in. You decide what stays out. And that's why the verse translated, looking diligently. You better give all your heart to this. Give all your might to this. Give all your attention to this. The word diligently implies the work that it takes to keep your heart free. Looking diligently. It doesn't matter who did what to you. It is your heart, your business to keep it free. Now you've got a bishop, your own heart looking diligently, and then it says, now listen to this, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Now wait, 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 wait. How can you fail of grace? Have you ever thought about that? What a strange verse. Isn't grace free? You don't do anything to merit grace. You don't do anything to earn grace if it's free, if it's unmerited, then how do you fail? How do you fail of grace? Yet the Bible says, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Well, I'm going to demonstrate it for you. Let's say you've got a problem with somebody in this church. And when you come into church, you do your best to avoid them. If they're sitting over there, then you do your best to sit right over here because you don't want to be near them. You want to kind of pretend that they're not even there. You know your heart's wrong. And then one day in church, during worship, the grace of God comes on you. And you know in your heart you're supposed to forgive. You know, God will grace you at moments to do things you can't do by yourself. 
He'll grace you to say no to sin that you would never say no to by yourself. He'll grace you to say yes to right things. He'll grace you to forgive. And all of a sudden, the grace of God is on you. When God is coming to help you do what you can't do by yourself, and all of a sudden, you've got a grace to forgive. And now you have to make the choice to embrace the grace or to harden your heart. If you embrace the grace in one moment, your heart can be made right and you can be readmitted into the wonderful presence of God. But if you harden your heart, you fail of the grace of God. Other scriptures call it frustrating the grace of God. When God is trying to help you, my how he's trying to help you do something you would never do by yourself. He's gracing you, but you are so obstinate, you refuse to participate with the grace. And then one day, the grace goes away. And when it goes away, you know what you've got? A root of bitterness. You could have been free, but you rejected the grace. You frustrated it. Now you failed of it. And now you're left with a what? A root of bitterness. The word root is the Greek word ridza. It describes something deep, 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 deeply rooted. The word bitterness is the Greek word pikria. It describes something sharp, something foul, something very caustic. And you always know when you have a root of bitterness because it begins to show up. That's why the verse says, lest any root of bitterness springing up. Everybody say springing up. The Greek word phuo, it describes a little bitty tiny blade of grass that's just beginning to push its way up through the soil. And when you first see it, it may not look very significant. It's just a little blade of grass. But if a blade of grass is coming up through the soil, it means there's something underneath the soil that's beginning to produce life. There's a seed that's beginning to produce and you usually know that you have a root of bitterness because of caustic things which come out of your mouth. That's where the seed is. And Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, what happens? The mouth speaks. What's in you is going to come out of your mouth. I learned years ago as a leader, I don't need to wonder what's in people's hearts. I just need to listen to them talk. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know if a person is materialistic because that's all they talk about. You know if a person just loves money because money is all that they talk about. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, even if you try to restrain it. There you are. People are talking about that person that you've got a problem with. They're saying good things. And everything in your flesh wants to say, yeah, but, yeah, but. Well, you don't know what I know. You try to restrain it. Try to hold it back. Then all of a sudden, here he comes. You just said something. You can't believe what you just said, but you can't help it because your heart is full. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. There's that little blade of grass showing up in your mouth and in your attitude. It's springing up. And what's really bad is it troubles you. And that's what the verse says. It troubles you. And that word trouble, you ready for this? It means to hex, to vex, or to stalk 
like a stalker. The very thought of that person stalks you. When you see that they're blessed, it just stalks you. It's like when we first started our TV ministry. There was a local man, Pentecostal preacher, another one. Evil, evil, evil. He was evil. Hated me. Did everything he could to destroy me. He himself worked with a local mafia. And one day the guys from my TV crew came to me and they said, Pastor, we need to buy new lights for the studio. I said, great, great, great. Go buy lights. So they came back about a week later and they had 50. Everybody say 50. 50 big TV lights like these right here. 50 of them. They set them in the studio, brought me in, showed me the lights. They were so proud of them. And I was getting ready to go to the United States, and my programs were each an hour long, and I needed to film eight programs, so that's eight hours of TV in one day. That's a lot of television in one day. Well, in our office, we had no air conditioning because these were the early days of the Soviet Union. There was no air conditioning anywhere back in those days. Well, when you're sitting under 50 TV lights and there's no air conditioning, it gets really hot. So you get creative to stay cool. So... I would wear a suit, but from my hips down, I wear shorts. And they would put both of my legs in two big buckets filled with ice cold water so that I would have cold on my legs to try to pull my temperature down while they were filming the upper part of my body. And I looked ridiculous, but it was all that I could do to try to stay cool while I was doing TV programs. So at the end of the first program, I went into the edit suite. And all the TV men were hovering over the monitors. They said, there's something wrong with the monitors. Look at your skin. There's something wrong with the monitors. You're too red. We can't seem to fix the monitors. So I went back in and filmed two more hours of television. Came out. Nobody looked at me because they're all hovering over the monitors. There's something wrong with the monitors. Why can't we fix the red? There's too much red in the monitors. Did another five hours, five hours of programs. Came out of the studio. They're still hovering over the monitors. The color's getting worse. The red's getting more intense. And finally, they turned around and looked at me. That's when they figured out it wasn't the monitors. <laughs> All of those lights were sun lamps. <laughs> Any here, anybody here ever been burnt by a sun lamp? Anybody here ever laid under 50 sun lamps for eight hours? And the ceiling was low, so they were right on me. And because my legs had been in water, the water magnified the effects of the ultraviolet rays, and my feet were horribly burned. I had a second-degree burn. And what was dangerous is my eyes were so burnt. Every time I blinked, it felt like somebody was dragging fragments of glass across my eyes. You know who sold them all those lamps? That mafia Pentecostal preacher. He did it on purpose. He did it on purpose. I went home that night so burned. We called the doctor in the United States. He said it was likely that I would wake up blind the next morning because I had looked into those lights for eight hours. Every time I blinked, I screamed in pain. And because the Soviet Union had just collapsed, there were no medications of any kind that were available. In fact, the pharmacies were completely empty. Well, where there's no medication, doctors get real creative. 
So the doctor came over and covered my whole body in mayonnaise and then wrapped me with saran wrap to hold in the moisture. I don't know if I'm a taco or a mummy. I can't move. I stink like mayonnaise. I'm wrapped in saran wrap and every time I blink, it feels like my eyes are being cut to shreds. And the whole night, I kept thinking, God, where is that Pentecostal preacher? I can't believe he would do this to me. Well, three days later, I had to go to the United States to preach. And you know how it is. When you're scheduled to preach, you go. It doesn't matter what you feel like. So I put on my hat so the sun wouldn't touch my head and put on great big sunglasses and hobbled onto the plane and took my seat. And in just a few moments, I looked up. Who was walking down the aisle of the plane? The Pentecostal preacher. He stopped right in front of me, threw his head back and said, ah! <laughs> I heard you got burnt. He said, I'm going to pray for you. I thought, pray for me. You did this to me. He slapped the front of my head with his hands, said, in the name of Jesus. And when he took his hands off of my face, my eyes were healed. And I remember thinking to myself, I'd rather be blind. than to be healed through that low-level slug. It just vexed me. It hexed me. It stalked me. He was free. He wasn't even bothered by what he did. Isn't that an amazing thing that somebody can do something wrong to you and they're totally free and you're just eaten up with what they did. They're not even bothered. And the end of the verse says, many people will be defiled. You know why it says that? Because if you've got offense in your heart, your mouth begins to speak. And when your mouth begins to speak, it defiles the listeners of every person that's standing around. That word defile is the Greek word spilos. It's where we get the word to spill, to spot, or to stain. With your words, you stain the opinion of every single person that is listening to you. Now let me ask you, how many of you have ever heard a bad report about somebody and you never forgot that bad report? You had a good opinion of them until somebody told you something, but then it was like there was a stain, a blemish, on your mind. You spotted them. You stained them with the overflow of your mouth. Now you gave your problem to somebody else. Now you're not only the one with a hard heart, now you're causing other people to have hard hearts. You've spotted, you've spilled, you've stained other people that are listening. This is why we have to be so careful what we say in the presence of other people. Parents do this to their kids all the time. Parents speak too freely in front of their children. They say bad things about the church and then wonder why their kids don't want to go to church when they get older. It's because with their mouths, they affected their children. They defiled them. Or rather than take it all the way to the end, where you failed with the grace of God, God tried to help you, you didn't take the help. Now your heart is so filled with a root of bitterness that it's beginning to spring up. You're beginning to say things that you normally wouldn't say that you would have never previously said. But there's a root down there that's beginning to produce life. And now you're finding every opportunity to say things. And with your mouth, you're beginning to defile others, 
affect the opinions of others. This is not positive. This is not beneficial. This is not going to do anything for anybody. It's just destructive. The solution is to start in verse 14 and stop with verse 14. Follow after peace. Rather than let it go that far, right from the very outset, say, nope, 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 nope. I'm not being drugged into that. I'm going to put on my hunting gear. And this boy isn't going to stop until I capture peace with that brother, until I capture peace with that relative. I'm not going to be dragged down or take anybody else down. I'm going to follow, 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 and aggressively follow until I obtain peace with all men. I am going to be different. And because of that, I'm going to be admitted into the wonderful, precious presence of God. Now, see, we can talk about this wonderful conference, which is Catch the Fire, Carry the Flame. That's a great name. But if you've got any of these issues, you can't even catch the fire. Can't even catch the fire. You can't even get into the presence of God. You stand in the most wonderful worship service and feel absolutely nothing, wonder what's wrong with everybody else. It's not everybody else. It's you. There's an issue in you. And so sometimes before you can catch the fire, you got to start with a little house cleaning. And that's why I felt led to speak on this tonight. This program was made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners.